like I told you, I've been serving uh, on the State Court of Appeals for six years. I am a lifelong conservative. Is that one term? Well, <laughs> it is. Uh, the, the court has six-year terms. I was appointed to fill an unexpired term, so I was appointed, I ran in the next election, and then I inherited the term of my predecessor, which expired another two years later. So I've run twice uh, in the first Court of Appeals, which is based in Houston, and uh, I'm in the middle of, of serving uh, my, my second elected term. Um, but uh, I grew up in a military family. My father was a career Air Force officer, and we, we grew up around the country and the world. Uh, I grew up with those military family, conservative, patriotic values. Uh, we were very involved in scouting, and I'm an Eagle Scout. Uh, I'm also a lawyer, and I've been successful as a lawyer. Uh, I've tried all kinds of civil cases, all the kinds of cases that you see in the Texas Supreme Court, personal injury and business disputes. I've represented plaintiffs and defendants. Uh, I was a partner in the trial department of Baker Box, which is one of the biggest firms in the state, one of the oldest firms in the state based in Houston. In my spare time as a lawyer, uh, I was a precinct chair in the Harris County Republican Party, and I was president of the Federal Society in Houston. The Federal Society, if you're not familiar with it, is the preeminent conservative lawyers group in the country. Very involved in advancing uh, conservative judicial principles, uh, the things that you hear people talking about, not legislating from the bench, judicial restraint. Uh, the Federal Society is a big part of that. Six years ago, Governor Perry appointed me into uh, a vacancy, and, and I will tell you it's the best job I've ever had. I, I really uh, love what I do. It is reading briefs and writing opinions, which most lawyers think sounds absolutely horrible, but uh, it's, it is my passion. It's what I love to do. And so I have, uh, I have a record of now hundreds of opinions that I've written as a judge on the Court of Appeals, and everybody is free to evaluate my credentials. Uh, I'm very happily married. You see my beautiful wife, Lindsay. Uh, she's an eye surgeon practicing in Houston with Houston Eye Associates. Uh, I honor God as our ultimate supreme lawgiver. And I honor the U.S. Constitution as something that I believe to have been divinely inspired and the greatest political document in human history. As a judge, I always do what I can to apply the laws as they're written. I don't take it upon myself to impose my own policy views. And my judicial philosophy can't be reduced to a bumper sticker, but I don't legislate from the bench. And I strongly believe that judges should resist that urge. All of this is a big reason why I felt a calling to serve as a judge. We have a crisis in our courts. We've been discussing it all night long. In the Federalist Papers, Alexander Hamilton described the judiciary as the least dangerous branch. He said it was beyond comparison, the weakest of the three departments of power, that the general liberty of the people could never be endangered from that quarter. That, that was the constitutional design, and, and our founding fathers just never could have imagined the raw power that is exercised by judges today. Um, that they would aid and abet the unconstitutional transformation of our economy and our health care system. That they trample on our Tenth Amendment rights, forbidding states from fully protecting the rights of the unborn. Uh, arrogantly presuming that they can redefine marriage relationships the essential building block of human society since God created Adam and Eve. So the 2016 election is incredibly important because the next president is going to have the opportunity to shape the U.S. Supreme Court for generations. I mean, maybe it's no exaggeration to say the future course of our country. And it's also important in Texas because we have the opportunity to show by our example what kind of judges we want and expect. Uh, we have the opportunity to elect conservative state Supreme Court justices, and we have the opportunity to hold accountable judges who do not honor their pre promises not to legislate from the bench. Now, how many of you in this room believe that tort reform may have had something to do with the Texas miracle, the economic success that we've had over the last decade plus? Uh, for over a decade, this has been an, a cardinal part of our Republican platform. Uh, Texas Republicans, uh, in the legislature have passed laws to weed out frivolous lawsuits that sap the energy out of our economy. And I am mounting a primary challenge. My opponent in this election 
is the most frequent dissenter on the Texas Supreme Court against the conservatives that we have there. She consistently votes to weaken our tort reform laws. Over half of her dissents that she's written have tried to water down tort reforms that Republican legislators have worked so hard to put into place. Now, as a judge, it shouldn't matter whether you agree with tort reform or you don't. My opponent has repeatedly shown she refuses to apply tort reform. She's simply hostile to it. Even though these laws have been validly passed by our state legislature, signed into law by our Republican governors. Those are the policy makers, and it's not our responsibility as judges, as judges to second guess that. It's our responsibility to implement those laws. Being a judge also means that you sometimes have to decide controversial cases. We don't get to pick and choose which cases we want to sit on. And we've described there, there's contra controversy coming down the pipe. Uh, our code of judicial conduct requires us to participate in every case assigned to us unless there's some law that prevents us from participating. Now, earlier this summer, the Texas Supreme Court decided a case involving a question of whether a divorce could be granted to a same-sex married couple. Uh, the, the court actually didn't really decide the case. They, they punted it on a legal technicality, which uh, I didn't agree with that outcome. Uh, there were three judges who dissented, and I agree with them that the court should have addressed the merits of the issue that is facing all of society. They should have addressed this issue of what the Constitution permits uh, Texas to do with respect to the regulation of marriage. And I especially admire one judge on the court, Justice John Devine, who was the only one who specifically addressed the question and, and wrote an opinion that strongly defended the U.S. Constitution, the true meaning of the U.S. Constitution, and the right of Texas to define uh, marriage as a union of one man and one woman. There were only eight Texas Supreme Court case, uh, justices who sat on that case. My opponent took a pass on the case. She failed to participate. She's refused to answer why she refused, why she participated in the case. You can find the argument video online and see her empty chair. Uh, if you elect me, uh, I will not run and hide from the difficult cases. Uh, I will not hide when it's time to stand up for the original meaning of the Constitution. I promise to honor my oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States as it was originally intended and as came from we the people. So I'm asking for your support in my race for the Texas Supreme Court and the opportunity to serve you as a justice there. Uh, my name is Michael Massingale. You can find me on Facebook. I have a website, www.michaelmassingale.com. We have push cards in the back that list my endorsements. I've been endorsed by Texans for Lawsuit Reform and most of the major grassroots organizations around the state. Uh, so we, we have a good head of momentum, and we're very optimistic, but uh, I, I would love to have your support. So uh, I really appreciate being invited to be here and share uh, some information about the Texas Constitution. Happy to answer more questions. Uh, just God bless you all for being here and for being involved in the process. Uh, God bless and guide our courts. And, uh, and God bless Texas and our country. Position on the court. Place three. Place three. Thank you. If you want to write a chat, please. Michael Massingale for Texas Supreme Court. Thank you. Uh, it's according to the Constitution, the state of Texas can't amass debt and have to pay a bill to the vote. But what about counties and school districts and other <coughs> governmental entities that, that amass huge debt as if there was no end to what they could spend and, 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 and uh, create more debt for? And some say economic catastrophe comes along and they can't pay so it goes to the state of Texas. And then all of a sudden the state owes all this money. Now why can't the state prevent these Government energy can up these big bills. They can. Uh, the short answer is they can. Uh, yeah, the, the, the state legislature uh, controls what the municipal uh, governments can do in that regard. Do it. Yeah, no, I mean, so, so uh, they, they can only do what, what our legislature permits them to do. Yeah, because they, they've got their school districts that owe billions. I mean, it, it's just so ridiculous, it's unbelievable. Same human being as a 
go on and pan money. They never stop. You know, it's uh, like, I don't know, it should be our kind of contemplation. You need to see how they can act like that. Well, if they do it and you're going broke, and uh, be, you know, it's like there's a big cliff here. They go on 100 miles an hour and don't even let off the gas. Well, I mean, I get emails from around the state, and I think it, it requires participation of people like in this room to, you know, to demand better. Um, but, but I think that people, that citizens have very successfully pushed back against, you know, exorbitant bond offerings. Uh, they, they push back on, uh, on the local government officials who approve them, and then they've defeated these things at the ballot box. Uh, uh, pretty successfully. So, but but if you're talking about limiting the authority to do it, the, the legislature has the power to do that. And one of the ways they can do that is to pass a law that there are no taxpayer-funded lobbyists because each of those school districts hire at our expense. Right. That we're paying for their own That's lobbyists. Right. They go to Austin to legislate. Also, county, county commissioners do the same. Their county Well, you have the ordinary political process where you, you know, you put pressure on your local right. representatives. You let them know what you expect. You express opposition. Uh, Did you say through the state? Or? Sure. The state legislature, you know, can can pass laws that restrict uh, the kinds the, the kinds of debt that can be uh, uh, amassed. I have one other question it's about the Greater Houston Partnership. <laughs> there was a. Uh, a ruling by the Supreme Court that allowed those people to run roughshod over the taxpayers. And uh, there was, uh, you know, this, this partnership is nothing more than a bunch of companies who want to do business with government. And, and they, they get buddies with politicians, especially in the Houston area there. And uh, all that is, I think, is sort of a, it's a way to, to uh, I think this is a great example of the tension that we describe um, that courts find themselves in. And it's interesting, I, this is my third judicial election. Anybody who wants to run for judicial office as a Republican knows that you have to say, I won't legislate from the bench. I'll follow the law as it's written. Um, and and the, the hard part is, you know, where, when the rubber meets the road, what do you do? And then do, do the voters even know? Do the voters have any information by which to evaluate are the judges doing it? Okay, so this case, and, and you know, I'm out speaking. I'm, I'm campaigning. I'm out there. And, and uh, I didn't participate in this case, but I've, I'm hearing a lot of uh, discontent with it. And... Uh, and I've read the criticisms. All of the criticisms about this opinion of the Supreme of the Texas Supreme Court are about the the policy outcome. They don't like that these uh, uh, so uh, uh, people were trying to get information from the Greater Houston Partnership, which functions basically like a chamber of commerce, and they wanted to get information about contracts uh, that that the Greater Houston Partnership has. And people are saying, as a matter of transparency, because they get they have contracts with the city of Houston and many other municipal areas. Areas that the people, uh, that the citizens have a right to get this information. Okay, we can all agree, and probably the judges on the Supreme Court would agree that's a good policy. That would be the good law. They they simply sort of applied the law, you know, and it came up to an outcome. So it's a situation where I think people don't like that outcome. The answer is not necessarily that the judges did a bad job. The answer is that now go to your legislators and say, okay, look, fix the law now. Whether they got it right or wrong, that's their decision. Now, the, the way the system works is, is not that that's the end of the, that's not the end of the discussion. That's the beginning of the discussion. We don't like that outcome. We go change the law to make it say what we want it to say. And, and, and we have a problem in this country of people thinking when a court rules on a case that that ends the conversation and that nobody can ever say anything about it, that, that we accept that answer. And it's wrong. It's simply wrong. So, so I think this Greater Houston Partnership case is, is, is a good example of that. 
people think there should be more transparency than resulted in that case, easy solution. Uh, next legislative session, ask Terry to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the legislature needs to go in and define a good meaning. What, what happened is they, they, they based it, they weren't, they didn't have to have taxpayer transparency because they weren't in existence or solely operated or existing on taxpayer funds. Yeah, but they got Even though they took the government, so they were. Right. Funded. So that's where the legislature has to come in and say, <coughs> take any taxpayer money, period. That's right. Well, that's what the law says, and they just disregard that. That's what Tulsa has to get all the money from the taxpayers. The standing opinion was brilliant. I read the word. <laughs> <laughs> I forget who made it, so it was really good that particular judge was going to go back and do it. Yes, ma'am. Oh. Yes, I'm, I'm curious if you had any dealings with the uh, recent ruling on the city charter amendment in Houston. I myself led a petition drive to uh, amend the city charter amendments to ban red light cameras. And we followed to a T, Article 11, Section 5 of the Texas Constitution of the very city. And the city government there, the, their proper role was to certify the petitions, which they did that. And then the tyrants decided to ignore the Texas Constitution. And I, yeah. so anyway. Uh, so the short answer to your question is no. Um, we have we have the most bizarre <laughs> the most bizarre situation in Houston, where we have two court of court of appeals that have entirely overlapping jurisdictions. So. I'm on a judge called, I'm on a court called the First Court of Appeals. There are nine judges on it. We have ten counties. And then there's another court called the 14th Court of Appeals. We're in the same courthouse. We have the same ten counties. And what happens is when somebody files a notice of appeal to, to appeal from one of our ten counties, the clerk is supposed to have a rotating system to say whether you know your appeal goes to the first or the 14th Court of Appeals. And all those cases went through the 14th Court of Appeals. So uh, so I didn't I didn't have any involvement with them. Other than as an interested observer, as a citizen of Houston, and I can tell you there's a lot of frustration. Uh, uh, th this is another thing. Uh, if you know our mayor and neither our mayor nor any of our representatives in city government in Houston campaigned on this. And, and there are people asking for an opportunity to have a referendum to be heard. They're given that right under the Constitution. And, and uh, I will say in this instance, credit to the Texas Supreme Court for vindicating that, those rights. Yeah, I was pleased with the ruling and I found it encouraging for my little battle. Uh, but there is, so since you're involved though, let me yes. tip you off because there was another uh, case that came out of um, I think San Marcos just a, a week ago, and uh, they denied relief uh, to the people who were seeking to advance their petition in San Marcos, and they pointed out that if you're asking for this fast relief from the Texas Supreme Court, you really have to be, you, you have to mind all of your deadlines and be ahead of it. You can't sort of wait until the last minute and then say the election is coming in two months. Well, you, we can't you, you have to, you, you really need to be organized. So, yeah, no, 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 I, and I don't know your story. I'm just yeah. saying that um, that in or, what, the, what the organizers in Houston accomplished, they accomplished because they were extremely well organized, they had good lawyers, they didn't give up, they sort of really went after it and, uh, you know, they, they looked like they were not getting anywhere and, and ultimately they came out on top. <laughs> I think I'm getting the hook. I, I, <laughs> no? Do we have somebody different that had a question? One, one more. Okay. I'll, I'll stick around. Okay. This really needs to last minute. Then you can catch it in the hall. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. My question concerns uh, property taxes and the trade reports. I don't know what the original Texas Constitution said about that. I'm wondering what it said and how that has evolved over the course of the year. This is the kind of question that at four in the morning when I'm at my computer writing my blog entries, I, I research. I, I don't. I can't tell you that off the top of my head. Um, but uh, but I'd be happy to follow up with you about it because. Um, so one of the things, and I didn't, I didn't get through my whole presentation. All right. Oh, it's gone. Um, <laughs> what, one of the things that I find 
fascinating, I'll end on this, about researching the uh, Texas Constitution is you can take these modern day questions that arise and, and you look at the Constitution and ask yourself, how did, how did we get this? The, the history of the Texas Constitution is extremely interesting because we've had, we've had several constitutions enacted during that period of between uh, being an independent nation, annexed as a state, and then there were several iterations of our state constitution during the Reconstruction era, and you can compare the changes in the constitution to what was happening in the state, in, in it was a very sort of volatile period of, of the nation's history and our state's history, and you can see, you know, why these things, you know, uh, are worded the way they are, you, you can see that the changes are made in reaction to what's happening in the state and in the nation, and then the subsequent amendments as well. So just like, you know, most of us look at the history of the 14th Amendment and the Civil War to have some, some context about what the 14th Amendment meant, and, and it might give us some data to say it wasn't about, it wasn't about gay marriage. Um, the same thing uh, applies to the history of of the Texas Constitution, and, and so, but I, I can't answer your question off the top, top of my head, but, uh, but I'm happy to follow up with you about it. And thank you again uh, for having me, and I'm happy to stick around and answer questions.